Hello and welcome. This is my wife, Mary, and I'm Ed, and we are Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. We're excited you're joining us today. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School Quarterly each week. This quarter's study is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. This week's lesson is entitled, Dealing with Difficult Bible Passages. The lesson for Sabbath afternoon begins the week by saying, what honest reader of the Bible hasn't come across texts that seem strange and difficult to understand? Certainly, at some point or another, we've all had this experience. That's why we'll take a look this week, not so much at difficult texts per se, but at what might be the reasons for these challenges and how, as faithful seekers of truth from the Word of God, we can work through them. So what are the reasons for some of these challenges? How do we work through them? As you know, many people leave the Christian or Jewish faiths because of these challenges. It is common for people to take an all or none stand with the Bible. People tend to believe either that the Bible does not contradict itself and that it is the source of all truth, or that it is hopelessly self-contradictory and that its God and its heroes are guilty of immoral statements, actions, and judgments, etc. Those who take the first perspective are usually devoted to defending the righteousness of the Bible no matter what it says, while those who take the second perspective often just throw the whole Bible out. This is an example of what is called a false dichotomy. It is when people see only two options before them, when really there are more. False dichotomies arise when people oversimplify the issue at hand. In this case, the problem posed by Bible contradictions in difficult passages. The main cause of this false dichotomy is the idea of a Bible canon. As we have discussed in past videos in this series, a Bible canon is a collection of books that is considered authoritative for religious beliefs and practices. The very act of making such a collection leads to oversimplification since it encourages people to judge what in reality is many things as though it were one. One thing. Again, the Bible is not one book. It is a term that refers to several different collections, each containing many books by different authors. To simply assume that all these different books should be judged as one thing leads people to taking all or none positions on either side. Some assume the Bible has nothing good to offer, while others assume that the 66 book Bible canon, for example, was given by God to be the be all and all word of God. But this, we have shown, is not the case. Let's review some of the main points we have looked at this quarter concerning the Bible canon. First, there was no Bible canon in Jesus' day or Paul's day. So far as we know, the first official Bible canon was created by the Catholic Church in 1546 at the Council of Trent in response to the Protestant Reformation and the debates going on at that time over the authority of various texts. The Catholic canon includes an apocryphal group of texts called the Deuteron canon, which is considered an inspired source for doctrine. Martin Luther, although opposed to the Apocrypha as a source for doctrine, in addition to opposing the books of Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation, did include all these books in his German Bible translation, showing that he did not subscribe to a rigid idea of a canon of scripture. The first reference we know of where the suggestion is made that the Protestant Bible should consist of the 66 books we have today was made by John Calvin in 1559 in the French Confession of Faith. There actually is no official Protestant Bible canon because there is no centralized body encompassing all Protestant denominations. Some denominations have prescribed an official canon, some have not. Ellen White never promoted a specific list of books to be considered canonical. There is no official Bible canon specified in the first statement of belief of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Second, Jesus did not promote a Bible canon because, in part, he did not foresee an end to the prophetic gift. And in fact, he saw the opposite. In John 16, 12, Jesus tells his disciples that he has more to tell them, but they could not yet bear to hear it. He did, however, promise to send them the Holy Spirit after his departure, through whom he would continue to teach them all truth and the things to come. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 13, Paul tells us that he himself spoke the wisdom of God to us as he was taught by the Holy Spirit. We know that Ellen White did the same thing 2,000 years after Paul wrote his letters. So Jesus, Paul, and the other first century followers of Jesus expected that God would continue to send prophets. But as you know, Christians soon lost this truth and came to believe that there were to be no more prophets. This belief is part of what paved the way to creating a Bible canon. 
After all, it only makes sense to create the definitive list of inspired and authoritative writings if you aren't expecting any more. Third, Jesus, Paul, and Jude all refer to writings outside of our modern Protestant Bible canons, some of which are no longer extant, like the scripture Jesus is recorded as referring to in John 7, 38, the epistle to the Laodiceans, cited in Colossians 4, 16, Paul's letter to the Corinthians before 1 Corinthians cited in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, which, if found, would make 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, 3 Corinthians. But some so-called extra-biblical books referenced within the 66-book canon have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, in particular an Aramaic copy of First Enoch, which is cited in Jude 14, and the Messianic Apocalypse, which is cited in Luke 7, 22-23, and Matthew 11, 4-5. In the same vein, we showed that Ellen White and the pioneers saw that some of the books contained in the Apocrypha were very beneficial to those that keep God's law and commandments. Ellen said that the wise of these last days should understand the Apocrypha. Although the pioneers hadn't made it a point of special study, they were evidently open to the possibility that some of these books were even inspired. Our founders clearly promoted writings that are found outside of the 66 books commonly held to be contained in the Protestant canon. See Ellen White, Manuscript 4, 1850, Joseph Bates, A Seal of the Living God, page 66, paragraph 1, D.G. Needham, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, August 5, 1856, page 96, paragraph 10, and James White, Review and Herald, February 2, 1869, page 48. And fourth, we also showed that 2 Timothy 3.16 does not prescribe a Bible canon, nor is it speaking of one at all. We showed that the word scripture is a transliteration of the Latin word scriptura, which was used to translate the Greek word graph, which simply means writings, not only in the New Testament and Septuagint, but in other Greek writings outside the New Testament contemporary with them. The point of the verse is that every writing that God inspired is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and so on. Not that every writing in a particular collection is inspired by God. And 2 Timothy 3.16 does not cite a list of writings or scriptures that are to be considered inspired by God either. Actually, there is no list in any canon anywhere that specifies a list of books to be considered the be-all, end-all word of God. Also, there is no prophetic communication in any form, whether in a writing, a song, a transcribed vision, or a recorded verbalization that has ever promoted a list of books as the source for all truth. The Bible canon is simply not an idea inspired by God. It is a tradition of man. Through all of this evidence provided in this series so far, our focus has been to show that the very idea of having a Bible canon is flawed and it is not something that God inspired. Thus, if we want to follow God in truth, we should not accept a Bible canon. One implication of this that we have covered is that we should be open to accepting writings that are not contained in the 66-book Bible canon popular among Protestants today. But there is another equally important implication that we haven't yet dealt with as overtly. We must also consider this other side of the coin, that there could be some writings contained in the 66-book canon or any other canon, Catholic or otherwise, that are not holy. I know this sounds shocking, but please bear with us here. This was shocking for us at first as well. Please take comfort in the principles that we have been pointing out throughout this series, that in fact, truth can stand the test of honest investigation. For example, if it is true that every writing in the 66 book canon is inspired by God, then testing them each individually will only reveal that fact. And if it turns out that not every writing in the 66 book canon is inspired by God, then an honest investigation of each individual writing will show that. Either way, we have nothing to fear so long as we love the truth. Consider these statements from Ellen White. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for many years by our people is not a proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth, and truth can afford to be fair. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. She also said, The God of heaven sometimes commissions men to teach that which is regarded as contrary to the established doctrines. Also, even Seventh-day Adventists are in danger of closing their eyes to truth as it is in Jesus, because it contradicts something which they have taken for granted is truth, but which the Holy Spirit teaches is not truth. 
And she also said, some have feared that if in even a single point they acknowledged themselves in error, other minds would be led to doubt the whole theory of truth. Therefore, they have felt that investigation should not be permitted, that it would tend to dissension and disunion. But if such is to be the result of investigation, the sooner it comes, the better. If there are those whose faith in God's word will not stand the test of an investigation of the scriptures, the sooner they are revealed, the better. For then the way will be open to show them their error. We cannot hold that a position once taken, an idea once advocated, is not, under any circumstances, to be relinquished. Ellen White also said, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. So let us not take a Bible canon for granted as being true just because we have believed it up until now. Let us move forward without fear, knowing that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth by means of evidence. This is a huge topic. It is a shaking topic, but it is certainly a reasonable topic, and it logically follows from the evidence. If God has not given us a list of writings to be considered canonical, to be the definitive list of inspired writings, then in reality, there could be only three options. It could be that all the writings in the Protestant canon are inspired, no more, no less. Or two, it could be that all the writings in the Protestant canon are inspired and that others are inspired besides them. Or three, it could be that not all the writings in the Protestant canon are inspired, whether any writings outside of it are inspired or not. In any of these three cases, it cannot be assumed that a writing is either inspired or uninspired simply because it was included in or excluded from any canon. It has to be tested on its own merits. But the whole idea of canonizing the writings inspired by God is flawed to begin with. What we need to understand is that what God wants is a relationship with humanity, and in relationships, communication never ceases. So we can see that constraining God to a canon is severely hampering his ability to have a relationship with us. Satan is the one who wants to keep inspired writings minimized to a canon list. Satan also wants to misrepresent God by this same tactic. Who says these difficult Bible passages are from God? The canon does. Now they may be from God, they may not be from God, but we shouldn't believe either of these positions without evidence. We should not rely on a man-made list to determine what God did or did not communicate or what he can communicate. The canon is not an inspired idea. It is a flawed idea. And remember, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10, in Revelation chapter 12, chapter 19, and chapter 22, all tell us that God wants to communicate with us until we all understand the righteousness of Christ, so that we can choose to put an end to sin in our lives and reach unity and perfection in Christ. We believe the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us through a living prophet today. Shouldn't we be open to include all relevant material in our studies, especially the most current inspiration? Ellen White did say that it is the present truth that the flock needs now. Early Writings, page 63. In reality, there is no way for us to even know the number of writings God has inspired through prophets, even if we tried to. Some of the writings surely have been lost, like the one Jesus refers to in John 7.38. Some were hidden from invading armies and not discovered until after canons were closed, either officially or in the minds of God's people. Some have been hidden from invading armies, or for other reasons, or for no reason, and are yet to be rediscovered. Some writings outside of a canon that we do have extant today may be inspired, but since certain men did not or do not consider them to be inspired, we do not ever read them because they are not contained in those man-made collections or Bible canons. And as we pointed out in last week's video, we can see from the sentiments written of Jesus or from the apostles and Ellen White that some inspired messages are surely yet to come because the messages of truth are constantly advancing and new developments therefore come up as these truths are unfolded as human history advances. We would never expect in a relationship that someone would stop talking to us because they have told us everything they needed to, especially if they loved us. A parent never stops communicating with their child, for example. Ironically, as I typed this, my adult daughter texted me asking for help with something. It's not possible that I could give my children a book of everything I have ever communicated to them. It's just not a thing. It's the same thing with God. Who could know or what could hold all the things he has communicated to us? John 21, 25 says, There are many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, 
I suppose the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So John twenty one twenty five indicates that it is impossible for a be all end all Word of God book to even exist. The only reason we think that there could be such a book is our unsubstantiated belief in a Bible canon. So what should we do? For starters, we shouldn't try to create a finalized collection of writings inspired by God. We simply can't. Second, we have to then evaluate each book individually on its own merits. We must do the hard work of finding out what God has communicated and is presently communicating to us. There are actually ways to do this. It is through the principles of materialism. Materialism is the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist movement and the foundation of truth, reality, and morality. More on that in a minute. But first, I want you to know that when I believed in the idea of the Bible canon, I never tried to understand why something is moral or not. I just assumed that the Bible is what determines truth and morality. Now, honestly, I did, as the lesson says, notice discrepancies, contradictions, and problematic passages. And honestly, these observations and internal questions did lead me from Catholicism to Protestant Evangelicalism to Seventh-day Adventism to Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventism but I never questioned the Bible canon itself until the present truth led me to. I did wonder about the Apocrypha, but that was only because I knew that Ellen White used Bibles that contained the Apocrypha. But honestly, I just never looked into it all that much. But now that we can see by evidence that there is no final list or collection of inspired writings, we need to ask ourselves if there are some in that said collection that we thought were inspired that possibly are not. Yikes. But I hope you can see that this is more reasonable than either throwing the whole Bible out or blindly accepting everything in the Bible without an honest, unbiased investigation of each writing on its own merits. Again, this is not as simple as an all or none dichotomy. It's a very complex issue. We really shouldn't treat a writing differently simply because it is in a Bible canon. That would not be fair and balanced. As we have mentioned before, the Lord loves equal balances, Proverbs 16, 11, and that means that we have to come at a writing free from personal biases, including a bias that we can have in favor of a writing simply because it is contained in a Bible canon. The truth is okay, whatever it is. Honestly, the truth will shine in brighter brilliance when it is freed from the shackles of a Bible canon. It will be exonerated from the error of man-made tradition and ideas, and God's beautiful character will finally be fully vindicated to the world. Materialism is the measuring rod we are to use to test the truth of a matter, any matter. Materialism is the belief that everything is made of matter, as opposed to spiritualism or immaterialism, which is the belief that something outside of matter could have existence. Believe it or not, we can use this reality to prove what is true and what is false. Satan does not want us to know this reality. He keeps us asleep by convincing us that we have need of nothing, when really, we need ISAB so we can see the truth. There are so many exciting aspects to this that we unfortunately do not have time to get into in this video, but we will not leave you hanging. We'll provide a link in the description below to the study called Materialism, Our Forgotten Foundation by Trent Wilde. It contains teachings from many of our SDA pioneers on this topic, including James White, B.F. Robbins, Uriah Smith, A.T. Jones, J.H. Wagner, R.F. Cottrell, and J.N. Loughborough, and others. Please also watch the videos on materialism we have provided in the end screen of this video. We will also discuss in a future video how to apply materialism to your studies. Thank you for staying with us through the entire video. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com, to learn more about who we are and, just as important, who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath School studies. God bless. Many blessings.